Today, my guest is Alan Shapiro. Alan grew up in the creative side of the advertising world, working with clients around the globe, telling their unique stories in unique ways. He has worked in advertising agencies and as a photographer. And today we get to talk with him about his journey. So please welcome Alan Shapiro. Hey, everybody. Hey there. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sounds good. Uh, let me let Steve in. Not sure where to start with you. you. Got portraits, food, flowers, birds, even pumpkins. Quite an eclectic, eclectic mix of subjects. Um, does any one area stand out for you? What do you really uh, want to do? What do I really want to do? I haven't figured <laughs> it out yet. I mean, I've only been shooting for like 10, 11 years. So this is still, I'm, I'm still a baby in this industry, especially compared to some of the faces I see <laughs> staring back at me. Um, I think, I think my favorite topic is portraiture but that seems to be the least lucrative these days mm -hmm. which is kind of curious i mean when i when i first started it was just it was stress relief it was therapeutic because my head was going to blow off and a good friend who was a photographer said you need a hobby and i didn't have one and he handed me a camera that's the old story and so every day i would walk to work you know through manhattan and i would find people to to shoot and then that got more and more interesting as I got deeper into their worlds. And I actually found myself getting a little bit depressed. I think I chose the wrong people. <laughs> and so that led me to a garden. And that garden was a beautiful place amidst all the, the chaos and the hecticness. And so that was, that was sort of a, a refuge. And then I don't know about the rest of you, but every now and then I find myself hungry and I like to eat. <laughs> And so what I decided I would do, I had all my favorite restaurants and I'd never shot food before, but I walked into one of my favorites where I knew the chef. And I said, I tell you what, I want to, I want to hang out in your kitchen and I want to, I want to develop a food portfolio. And so he let me, and then that led to my showing other people things and it became a trade-off. It's like, let me shoot. And if you like something, every picture you like, I'll trade you a meal. And then as I got better, it became every picture you like, I'll trade you a multi-course meal or I'll trade you, you know, a meal with my family. And, and uh, then somehow a magazine found me and that led to all sorts of commission-based things. And along the way, there was this little place that some of us might remember called Google Plus because I hated Facebook at the time. And because I was such a beginner and I really felt like a beginner, I, I thought, let me document this journey. Let me share as much as I can. I mean, I was, a, I was a trained designer and I had grown up in the advertising world, but I was always directing other people with cameras. So I didn't know a thing. And if any of you ask me technical questions, you'll embarrass me because I, you know, I am not per se a technical shooter, although I think I know my way around. Um, but documenting that journey and starting to tell the stories about the work. And I'm a huge believer in sharing context and emotional experiences. And, and for me as a creative person, it, it works a different part of my brain. You know, the, the, the shooting is one aspect. And then the thinking about the shooting, either before or after, is a totally different aspect. And, and writing is different than using your finger to, to you know, twiddle and tweak and take pictures. So it was almost like the equivalent of an upper body and a lower body workout. And that got me thinking and talking to lots of people. And then Google invited me to give a talk and you know things sort of spiraled out of control at that point. Uh, again, I still think of myself as a, as a student, but now I find myself teaching or at least coaching and helping guide people because the journey is fascinating. and. You know, I think the more we're in it together, I, I was surprised as an advertising guy because I worked with some very famous photographers. And as soon as they found out that I was taking pictures, they got very protective of their work. You know, where I used to hang out in, in the studio, I was relegated to the green room with the clients, with the M&Ms. And, you know, was, and that, that was very upsetting to me. I don't, and anyway, so here we are. Yeah. So, do you want to see some work? Yes, Maybe please. I missed it, but what what agency did you originally work for? Was it in Manhattan? Yeah, I I, I worked within the Omnicom network. I actually had my own agency, and they bought it. Uh, and that's when I thought maybe I'll retire. And they said, No, you can't retire. 
um, you you have to earn out your thing. And then as I rose within the Omnicom network, they had 278 agencies at the time. And so um, the higher you get in an organization, you know, the more you start hearing problems rather than opportunities. You start you start getting getting the angry calls, not the the wonderful joy filled calls. It wasn't about the Super Bowl commercial that broke all records the other day. It was about I don't like my team. Can you switch them? Where where was the agency? What uh, what was the address? In Manhattan. Manhattan's, so, a, big, Manhattan's a big island. <laughs> you are Madison Avenue. And. Uh, anyway, let me start sharing. You don't want to tell me, okay. Hmm? Madison Avenue and <laughs> 50, 53. Well, the Omnicon Group. 49. Look up Omnicom Group. I started on Fifth Avenue because I was downtown and I liked that better. And then I moved uptown. You know, I moved out of New York to what is it around 85 or 86 at the time Saatchi and Saatchi were buying up all the agencies. Yeah. So... Omnicom formed, I don't, I, I have a bad head for years, but mm -hmm. BBDO, DDB, Needham, and what was then called Shiate, now called TDWA. Mm -hmm. And that was like the first mega merger because agency holding companies, each of those BBDO was hundreds of offices around the world and they don't like to work together, but they decided, you know what, there is strength in numbers. And so they became the first holding company. And then the agency that I had was one of the first that was brought in after that and began what was then called diversified agency services. So all of the smaller agencies that really didn't have hundreds of offices, maybe just had a few offices. Uh, but then it was all about collaboration. So it wasn't like what agency you were with. It was about we're pitching Bank of America and there would be 20 agencies who's going to take the lead. Hey, Alan's really good at talking. Let's let him lead the presentation. So it, there was a lot of pressure, hence taking pictures. Anyway, so that's work. Well, that was first career. So then as I'm walking around the city, I, I always tell people this, the bigger the smile you give, the bigger the smile you get. And you know that was my going in assumption because here I'm in New York and everyone's gonna be cranky, myself included. How was I gonna get people to like open up to me? Uh, let me, it didn't work as well <laughs> as I wanted, um, but I started having fun and God, I, you know, people, getting people to smile is easy. Getting people to, you know, flip you off. Well, in New York, that was easy too. <laughs> But it became an exercise. I love the tones in this photo that's on your website. Thank you. Thanks. So getting people to emote in a less traditional way. See, we're getting a New York welcome for all of you. Um, <laughs> getting people to emote in less traditional ways was always interesting to me. It was, it was kind of a fascinating process. How could I get someone on a street to, you know, in this case, make this face? I, and I think if I remember correctly, I told him that the ugliest girl in his class had a crush on him and he just found out, show me. And that was, that was his reaction, which was perfect. Um, this is a gentleman I met on the lower west side, just walking around and we started talking and it turns out he had a huge, he had like over 150 Leica cameras, but he never used them. He was an architect. He just liked how they looked. And as we're walking, you know, I found the dark uh, alleyway and I put him in the back and I just said, okay, let's, let's, let's have some fun together. So for me, one of the easiest exercises, particularly with people, and, you know, I, I was at that point walking around with a really big camera because uh, that's all I had. Your name and, wasn't Ugly Georgia back then, was it? <laughs> no. <laughs> big camera in the alleys. <laughs> yeah, right? Isn't that creepy? Right? <laughs> Um, but no, I, I smile a lot, so I, I, <laughs> I wasn't all that intimidating. Um, but let me go back. So the, the aspect of show me love, show me hate was a really interesting exercise. And, and it became one of the warm up exercises for a lot of the people that I was working with. So, and it's interesting because there is something happens. I'm, I'm, also, I'm a student of psychology to some degree because there were many, many, many people who, when I said, show me hate, said, well, I don't hate. It's like, all right, well, show me disgust, show me something else. 
And then ultimately they got to it. And as we were talking during the process, they would get to, you know, I really do hate certain things and blah, 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 <laughs> blah. And so it was almost, uh, you know, a cathartic reaction for some of them. And then as I would go back and forth, show me love, okay, now show me hate and show me love and show me hate, the expressions would get bigger and different. Uh, another interesting exercise. So this is one of the, she's now retired, but she was an editor at Vogue and she just, she would not smile no matter what. And she just said, no, I said, show me what you're like at work. And she said, this is it. And um, boy, that was, she was very interesting. And again, just exercises in finding interesting people and getting them in some cases to stare me down. In other cases, I would ask people to close their eyes and think about either the best thing that ever happened to them or the worst thing that ever happened to them. Um, and the stories that I was told, and in many cases, when I said, close your eyes, you know, I'm going to tell you when to open them. And there's a trick to that because you don't want people blinking, you know, especially when you have groups of people, not that I like taking pictures of groups, but, um, you know, having them close their eyes and then open them, you're less likely to get a blink as you're shooting. Anyway, in many cases, I found that their the calm that came over them as their eyes were closed was so much more interesting than when their eyes were open. So that became a series and ultimately it, it got documented across many, many people. I should have showed you that, but I don't know. Sometimes the stories don't necessarily connect with the images, but- Hey, Ellen? Back. Hey, yeah? Ellen, could you hit the F key on your keyboard? Better? There we go, that's better. Okay, sorry. No, it's just better at full screen. Okay. Uh, but then I can't see you. I can't see anybody's <laughs> reactions. I'm just looking at my own work, which I don't like doing because, uh, you know, every time I look at my work, I don't know about the rest of you, but I just see flaw after flaw and I want to reprocess or reshoot or whatever. I know uh, these tones are tones are great. I'm, I, and I see like you're 95% black and white so far. Is so that far. a conscious? Uh, I. When I first started, I was very sensitive. You're going to find this surprising, but I'm colorblind. Um, mm -hmm. And colorblindness is one of those things where I never really saw it in real life. But every time I would go to the eye doctor and they would give me a colorblindness test growing up, I would flunk it miserably. And so as I'm starting out with the camera, I was hypersensitive. So it was a lot of black and white back in the day because I was certainly more comfortable with that. And okay felt better. So this is a gentleman who had just gotten out of jail after being in a coma, you know, for a few years, after being in a coma for six months, after doing something that I never found out what he did, but that was the story. And, you know, this is just in a pizza parlor. And then, you know, sometimes the, the, the aspect of rejection and don't shoot me and, you know, I don't take good pictures was always the thing. And of course the photographer's response is that's okay, I do. Um, but I found myself getting fascinated by the, the awkward poses. It's like, all right, you know, so her first reaction was to cover her face. It's like, all right, could you just open your fingers for me? <laughs> all right, now open them a little bit more. And just the process of that. And I think, you know, at the, by the end of it, she was chuckling out loud and, you know, it was, it was an interesting exercise. Um, I'm a huge fan of Greg Heisler's work. This is almost an homage to him. This was sure. one of the, uh, one of the, uh, I, the, the, the cleaner upper guys. I don't know what the political correct phrase is these days, but you know, he was like one of the janitors at the agency who would just walk the halls and empty garbage barrels late at night and early in the morning. And I just became really friends with Don, uh, really good friends with him and you know, he would come in and we would just talk about his life and my life and what's going on. And, and depending on the day, it was a different portrait every day. So I probably have a few hundred portraits of him, you know, one more interesting than the next. Um, and then this is my gardener, it was my gardener, Charles. And he just had this beautiful face. And, and I said, you know, in another world, you would have been the king of some exotic country where, you know, nubile people, you know, oiled, brought you dates and things. And, and as I'm telling him that he's smiling and then we stopped talking and he said, yeah, but here I am. And then this was the face I got. 
and that for me it was the uh -huh. you know, I really should show the the before and after. Here's one of the the you know close your eyes and show me something. We were we were traveling. My daughter and I were traveling through the South. I don't know if we were in North Carolina or South Carolina or maybe even into Tennessee, but we found this woman and she was talking about the civil rights movement to my daughter. And you know, I I just I think in so many cases for me the the experience of being in the moment with some of these people was so much more powerful than the photo that came out of it. It just, for me, it prompts an interesting story. Um, as did this gentleman. He was just walking around, you know, this is Brooklyn, and he was walking around on a cloudy day, and we got to talking, because how can you not talk to someone like that? <laughs> um, and so I'm going to play a game with you because, you know, we were talking about, you know, sort of published work versus personal work. And many of these started out as personal works and ended up getting bought either by individuals or companies for whatever their, you know, their, their given service or products were. Um, I didn't do a lot of editorial work until I started shooting food. So a lot of the portrait work led to assignments for companies like Lockheed Martin and General Motors and OnStar, which is a division of General Motors. And they would just have me shoot, you know, whatever, the people who, who found the cars interesting and attractive. This was one of my favorite and most disturbing shoots. I was leading the Google Plus third anniversary. So it goes back a ways, photo walk in New York. And I wanted to demonstrate sort of the process of like sort of working with people and just approaching anyone. and. Um, I went to these two and uh, there were about 300 people on the walk behind me. And I called her, I beckoned her over and I said, so what do you think? You guys look like you're really kind of head over heels in love. And she shook her head and she said, no, not really. And I said, okay, well, on my prompt, I want you to show me how you feel about him. And then I called him over, uh, you know, separate from her. And I said, so is she the one? And he said, oh my God, yes. I said, okay, well, so on my prompt, I want you to just give her the, the biggest kiss you've ever given her. So then I went and I told the group, not re, you know, in a kind of a stage whisper, but far enough away where they couldn't hear, went back to them, I said, are you ready? And like, they were facing each other. And she, when he went in to kiss her, she did this. She just looked away, gave him his, her cheek rather than her lips. And that was the expression. And this now hangs somewhere in Google. I, you know, they, they made this enormous print. Um, and it was just an interesting exercise in what we can do. And then sometimes it's about finding, finding magic in just wandering around. So this was a, uh, a charity group that I was invited to tag along with down in the Dominican Republic. And I was always very taken by this particular shot. And in color, it is beautiful, but in black and white, it just speaks to me because, you know, I, I would ask students what people notice when they look at this. And, you know, they talk about the motorbike and the leading lines. It's like, no, look at the, look at the, the boy's sweater. You know, look how it is, it is some hand-me-down from some much smaller child and, and then look at his expression. And so I, I don't know if, if I didn't point it out and you were being hypercritical, all of you very esteemed and experienced people, what you would see in this. And so that leads me to a different kind of rhetorical question. You know, does the context help or does it get in the way? Does knowing the backstory or the side story or the front story, does it make a difference? To me, it does, because at some point, you know, I want my children or my children's children to be able to look at my work when I'm long gone and say, oh, uh, I don't know what's happening now, sorry. A little screen challenge. There we go. There you go. Yeah, but things are. I wonder if has everyone seen the black bar through the top of the photo? Well, is it better now? Well, I see your library develop 
books. You do? Yes. Yeah. How is that possible if I'm in? <laughs> oh, all right. Let me. So I was seeing something totally different than you are. Let's do this. Isn't that the mark of a true artist? You see something else. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. You see. All right. uh, let's. Okay. So just a few more portraits that speak to me. I don't want to. I don't want to belabor the point about you know this because it's the early work. One of the things that it did lead me to was a multi-year relationship with Lockheed Martin. And normally, I, you know, I, I thought going into this that if any company would call me, like, what would happen if a cigarette company called me because I was a non-smoker? It's like, yeah, I would say no. And well, what about an alcohol company? Oh, I would say absolutely. I'd work for free. I'll trade you. <laughs> and then, well, what if a defense contractor called you? It's like, ooh, that's an interesting one. And then they did. So. Um, I had, I have a absolute beyond adoration for our nation's veterans. And so I was just documenting them for years and years and years. New York has a huge Veterans Day festival. Uh, I would go every year and because I'm talkative, I would get, I would talk my way into other events and, and VFW halls and whatever. And, you know, and Ultimately, it got on the radar of Lockheed Martin. I never really found out exactly how, other than we saw your work and we like your attitude. Was the so would you would you travel around the country and would you shoot veterans for us? And I said, absolutely. That's like, I, how little are you going to pay me? Because that's like a dream job. And they said, well, it, you know, we for us it's about saying thank you, and so we just want you to capture as many of them as you possibly can. So again, a delightful, delightful project until you meet a gold star mother and you know, then back to despair, uh, at least for me, because being kind of empathic, uh, the stories I started hearing. So then that took me to other places. Before we get to flowers, I, one, of the, one of the first well-known clients that called me, called me because of my bird work. Uh, it was the Ritz Carlton Hotels, and they said, we're creating this concept bar up at the top floor of some of our skyscraper hotels, and we're looking to decorate. Would you be interested in developing some artwork for us? And I said, sure. Like, how do we go about doing that? Because this started out as just a bird portrait on black, because I have friends at the Bronx Zoo, and they would let me, you know, they would sneak me in and let me shoot not through bars, but actually with some of the, the creatures. Um, and they said, well, you know, we're thinking it, we could sit you down with the decorators and, and things like that, but we would just like it to be a little bit over the top. And I had just come from the Metropolitan Museum of Art where they had the Renaissance portrait show. And I was absolutely fascinated with recreating the textures and the, the worn look. So this is kind of an exercise in post-processing where I just, I mean, some of these have literally hundreds of layers in Photoshop over just a very simple photo of a bird, um, but they got blown up and printed huge with the most incredibly ornate and ridiculous frames. And, you know, it was, it was for me, it was like being a kid in a candy store. Um, so some of the original work, this, this particular guy led to a ongoing relationship that I still have with what used to be called the Zeit, but now Zeit, the newspaper uh, in Germany. And they just say, shoot birds looking, looking quizzically, and we're gonna, we'll figure out what to do with them. And they, they pair them with interesting quotes in the newspaper and they run full page. And I guess, you know, I don't really get all of the meaning in German. Uh, it never translates as well, but I, I hope people are smiling throughout Germany and laughing at us. So did so, you create your own textures for those? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Back to the to the birds. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, New York is kind of cruddy and, you know, so <laughs> the concrete and the peeling paint and whatever and other things. It just it was a nice. It was a fun process. And then I got into macro and I think the macro again, going back to the, the beginning of our conversation was really about just, you know, finding, finding beauty in the smallest places. 
And that has become one of the things I guess I'm better known for. Uh, it certainly brings me a lot of joy as I tell everyone who asks, I mean, there's, there's no way you can stay unhappy in a beautiful garden or an arboretum or, mm -hmm. you know, you just can't. And even if you go in with a, with a bad attitude and, or you're in a bad mood, by the time you're done, you come out um, in, a, in a more beautiful place. And so part of that whole exploration of the macro genre, you know, led to shooting on light boxes and just exploratories into composition. And uh, again, what I consider a daily creative exercise regimen, I shoot for an hour a day and I process for an hour a day, you know, it doesn't matter morning or night. It's just, I must do it. It's a mm -hmm. way for me to get started before I, you know, do any agency work or before I have real clients come in and say, hey, let's do exactly what I want you to do. It's kind of practice. It's, it's throwing things down and seeing what I can make happen. It clears my head. It's like yoga. Um, and then one day this company called Bose who makes all sorts of you know, sound bars and things, they said, we, we think your work is kind of relaxing. And when people are in our retail stores and they're in our demo room, we want to make those rooms more relaxing. So could we buy a whole bunch of your work and can we put it up around the world everywhere there's a Bose store and fill our music rooms, our demo rooms with, with art. But the, uh, it's got to be on one condition. It has to be local to that store. <laughs> so God, this dream project became almost a nightmare project because now it's like, okay, they have a store in Dubai, what do I wanna show? Is it succulents, is it this, you know, okay. So now we're in Washington, DC, what, what are the more native flowers there? Um, and so on and so forth. So the, some of these just became wall size and that, you know, that paid for a lot of medium format gear because you certainly can't do it um, small. And I don't know, the black and white is just a totally different Kind of experience for me goes back to the original portrait days and then of late i find i'm trying to become more painterly with my work and so in a lot of cases it's you know it's not just the shooting but it's the processing and what can i make happen and what what emotions can i evoke um, and then back to food you know some of these were just playing around because I tell people, especially during a pandemic, every, every trip to a supermarket, you know, whether you go every couple of days or once a week, every trip to the supermarket is an opportunity to play as a photographer. So find yourself an old baking sheet. This, I call my million dollar baking sheet because that's about, how, you know, how many uh, shoots it's been in. And, you know, it is, it is years and years old. And Sometimes it's just playing and sometimes the playing results in clients like, you know, the New York Times calling and saying, hey, we're going to do a, an article on pea pods or snow peas or snap peas or, you know, can you, can you do your thing for us? This was just playing around with an octopus. This goes way back to a story, to a, a, a shoot I did with my son where I put a live, not a live, but a, a fresh octopus on his head. Uh, he was 14. It was sort of the grossest and best experience a father and son can have <laughs> together. Uh, the shoot should have been over in 10 or 15 minutes, but I made him keep it on his head for hours. Uh, sort of payback for all the, you know, all of the stuff that only a 14-year-old boy can make a dad endure. Um, but that led to, really, you like working with octopus. Hey, can you do something for us? And um, I happen to have a pet tarantula is a gift from my daughter who's now about to enter veterinary school um it's a lovely gift but uh i started looking at relationships and you know if the 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 tarantula is a pretty solitary animal arachnid whatever and but if they were to go out and want to date what would they find interesting probably not another spider because they're very aggressive. And I happened to be in an Asian market and the rambutans were in 
uh, on display at the front of the store. And it just gave me an idea that maybe my spider would kind of start crushing on a orangutan. And that led to a whole series of things. So this was the practice shot. This got commissioned by a food magazine. And I don't know, I can't imagine, you know, I never saw it in print, but mm -hmm. they paid for it and maybe it's <laughs> hanging in someone's hall, but you know, like this is not something that we want to put next to a macaroni and cheese recipe for sure. <laughs> And we're not making fruit salad with spiders running around. So I don't, you know, I, I never really thought about what happened because it doesn't matter. Um, and then what you'll notice in some of these, so I started a collection of ladles. And so they became kind of a theme in my work. And then clients would start to say, hey, can you do something with ladles and spoons? And so that led to this is clearly an outtake, and I know that because it's crooked, but the original was really straight, to this ongoing series for a food magazine um, using spoons and various ingredients. And it just became for them like an ongoing theme that they enjoyed. And for me, it was just wonderful. And again, back to practice in this day and age of COVID, you know, working with a bigger team is not practical. And so learning how to style food became sort of an interesting adventure. Um, so I avoided it completely and I just went back to shooting things that I could find and not have to prepare. And that, this, the practice led to this, the commission. And a different client saw that and said, can you do something for us with dead flowers? not dead flowers, aging flowers. And I said, sure. And so it, it's always fascinating to me. And then, you know, a company like a crate and barrel or a pottery barn will often call and say, we've got new dishes coming out. Can you just show us what you would do? Make it colorful, make it simple, play. Uh, and so in a lot of cases, it's an exercise in doing what I think is interesting and if they like it, great. And if they don't like it, well, they're really good at course correcting. And so it's, it's kind of this wonderful, lovely life that from a, from a photography standpoint, I just get to play with food mm -hmm. and occasionally, you know, find myself roaming around gardens and doing really interesting, fun, simple things. Um, this took a while because, you know, you have to go and collect lint. And I, again, I didn't think to go to a laundromat. So I was collecting it from my own washer and dryer. And, um, the challenge there is lint is essentially either blue or gray. You can't find colorful lint. So if anyone has colorful lint and they want to send it my way, I would be greatly appreciative. Uh, but, um, you know, this is just some of the work and I feel like I'm talking too much. Um, so oh, Michael has asked a question over in the chat. Are you working with stylists, location scouts, uh, and do all your jobs include expenses and third party fees and rentals? And are these of work for hire or do you own the copyright? Hold on, that was way too many questions. <laughs> I need to get out of this sharing thing. Let me escape. Uh, so I can look people in the eye <laughs> yeah, I... and talk to people. Okay, so let's let's unpack that a little bit. Yeah, Am I don't I know if you have the with... chat open there. Okay, I I don't, but I will. Um, am I working? I will. I love working with a bigger team when it's something I'm not comfortable with. So if I'm asked to do what I'll call an environmental portrait shoot, and and. I really, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. I will invariably bring hair or makeup or, or you know, in some rare cases, because I don't do a lot of fashion at all. Okay, uh, so how about no a scout? Huh? How about a location scout? Nope, nope. I know my city and uh, it, even when I travel these days, you know, it's funny. So I started my career back in, uh, in the 80s. And boy, did we have huge budgets back then. And, you know, we would, we would go location scouting in a helicopter and we would have a chase helicopter because there would be 
not just one art director, but two art directors. And we, you know, and and then we would first go to the shoot. Now things have changed. Budgets have gone. Now, was this while you were working at the agency or after yeah. you left the agency? Uh, well, I, I, I still work in marketing. I just now have two careers. So going back in the 80s, it was huge crews. Now it is the most minimal crew possible. One, because the budgets are smaller. And as a, as a, as a creator, I want to optimize my profit. It's really about identifying the need and being really clear what you're good at and what you're not good at. So obviously, Michael, if someone asked me something that I didn't know the answer to, or if I was required to create something where I needed help, you bet I'd be on the phone and I would have as many people as possible helping. Um, I just don't find, I would say these days, if I have a crew every, maybe once a month, that's a lot. Okay, so including food stylists. I'm, I'm not called upon to do such elaborate food prep unless I'm in a restaurant environment and then I have the, the, the staff and the chef. So these days, even the magazines are optimizing things and they're saying, okay, come to our test kitchen. We have all our home econom economists, you know, they'll work with you. So I consider that different than bringing in a food stylist. Did I answer your question? You're looking at- Well, me that you answered <laughs> sort of the first part of it. Let's yeah. go on to the next part of it. Okay, which is oh, John, you want to say it, or do you want me to repeat? Yeah, you it? can. You can ask the question. So, are are you doing are you doing any uh, work for hire, or or is everything your own? And no. What did you do with the stuff that you you did a barter on? So, fifty fifty of my current work is work for hire versus personal work. Fifty percent of my assignments, someone has come to me and said, "Solve this problem for me." The other 50% of my work is work I'm doing for myself and then offering either in, you know, as stock or sharing it with some of the art buyers that I know in hopes of prompting a commission. But sometimes yeah, but work, but, but work for hire means that you do the work and they own it. Yeah. So it varies by, it varies by the client. Sorry. Okay. See? So you, so you, so you do, you do one, you do, it just depends on the client, whether you do yeah. um, work for hire or um... maybe I'm naive, but these days, at least oh, you're not the, naive. <laughs> the people <laughs> I am working with will will invariably say we want it for this period of time. We want to we don't want to quibble about how we use it, where we use it. And here's the rate. And are you comfortable with us owning it for that period of time? Rarely do they come and say we want to own it outright. Well, Did if I you're doing it? a work for if you're doing a work for hire, then then essentially they own it outright. Yeah, I so let me correct myself. No, it's not work for hire. You're licensing for specific time periods and uses. Always, always, always for yeah. unless they unless they specifically ask for a buyout. And now, are, 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 do you do buyouts? Yeah, of course. If the money's good. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, one of the things I didn't show you because I don't, I I lost it. One of one of the, the biggest uh, privileges I had, I got a call from Apple Computer a couple of years ago, and they said, we wanna buy four of your flower images and we can't tell you what it's for, but we're gonna be using it all over the world. And it's for one of our products and it is for the launch campaign of one of our products. So now when you have that and you're dealing with an Apple buyer, uh, with a, an art buyer at Apple, you know, so I came up with a number, um, and this is after calling 30 of my closest friends who you know, were professional photographers and saying, it's Apple, what do I do? Because I had no idea. So I, uh, and the joke is I gave them a number and they, they said, okay, is that just for the United States? Because <laughs> you know, that it, was, it was clearly too low. And I you said- said okay. yes, immediately, yeah. <laughs> All right, but I am not that kind of person. And I just said, can you just guide me along? But, but but what's confusing me, and I, I am who I am. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, that, that's because I've I've had the experience of getting reamed because I live in New York and had a had a had a studio in Manhattan. Also, it's a big yeah. island, but I, my studio was in the photo district. Um, um, but you coming from an advertising agency, 
uh, with art buyers and, and people that, you know, surrounded uh, or protected the agencies, yeah. you know, to, or at least you should know to ask, is it local, regional, well, national, uh, worldwide, so that, and how many different languages? Okay. And that's when I say how long and where, that is part of it. But the art buyers that I used to work with when I was a kid in the industry are long gone. A lot of agencies don't really, you know, they, you have producers when you're doing commercial work. But for me, I, I didn't, I was, I didn't know who to go to. So I was naive. How many of the clients you currently work for are still clients of the agency that you work for? Zero. It's uh, two separate careers. I don't. No, no, I understand that, but 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 a client is a client. Uh, I'm not understanding your question, Michael. I think we're getting way off the topic. Yeah, yeah. No, let's no, just, no. We're at, I feel we're, like no, you're trying to no, trip me up on something. No, no. You're absolutely. We're absolutely not getting off the topic. The reality <laughs> is that yes, I used to work for Gray Advertising. And, so and, 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 and the GM building? Uh, 333 on 3rd Avenue. No. no uh, I'm, 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 I'm but sorry. they've moved over time, but uh, yeah, Gray, yeah, we'll no, settle okay, on my, Gray. Okay. So, um, so a lot of the clients that I had when I, when I was working for Gray and when I split away from Gray, all right, yeah. I still retain those clients as an independent uh, photographer. Mm -hmm. is, is that the same, same old, same old? I, when I was working, as I worked at Omnicom, I've since left, I was not taking pictures for Omnicom. I was a creative director and ultimately an executive vice president, chief creative officer. So I was directing, not taking. The photography clients came to me directly so second career. Okay. And that's where I was really inexperienced. But didn't you have the, the, the authorization to pick and choose what, what uh, images you wanted to use for whatever client or clients you were responsible for? Yes, but that was, well, yeah, but you're mixing things. So when we, as a creative director, hiring whomever to work for me, for the agency on behalf of this client, the relationship existed creatively with the creative team. And then all of the business dealings were done by the art buyer or the producer at the time. So. Yeah, let's, let's get off well, John, the business I side of it a, a bit. I have a question that yeah. actually is about um, uh, his work. <laughs> Nice. Um, so, uh, Alan, I'm actually quite shocked. I never really looked at your website. Uh, your work is very impressive, and I'm not easily impressed. So, kudos <laughs> on that. Um, a couple of questions. Number one, do you have a standard way of approaching clients um, because of the fact that you've got such a wide body of work? In other words, uh, you know, you've got portraiture, you've got flowers, you've got food. Uh, and pumpkins. You don't have a lot of landscape. Yeah, uh, landscape scares the piss out of me. Same uh, here. <laughs> it's um, too big. But, uh, anyway, so um, uh, how do you deal with the fact that uh, a lot of people like to hire specialists, not generalists? I, I, have, been, I have been incredibly fortunate in that I have not had to solicit clients. The, the, the ones that have allowed me, have paid me, have, have been significant, have found me and have thrown off enough money. Thank, uh, you know, I don't know how to say this without sounding incredibly grateful, right? This is, <laughs> for me, this is a unexpected second career that I never planned on. I am, I feel really, really lucky. And well, so, the harder you work, the luckier you get. That was, uh, okay. But for me, it was, it was truly about the therapy, not the money. I, I, I made my, I'm, I have my advertising career 
to thank for my life. And now there's this other side and it's like being a kid in a candy store. So oh. now I can tell you though, that my wife to be uh, keeps saying, well, aren't there agents? Aren't there, aren't there people? Can't you get a rep? Because, you know, we talk about this. It's like, well, what's next? Who do you want to work for? And it's like, whoever calls me next. I don't, I don't think I have the time to go out and solicit because I'm kind of busy. And so it's a, it's a bit of a catch 22. So if you have advice, Jeff, <laughs> throw it my way. Um, then the other question I was going to ask is uh, the backstory or the context you talked about Sometimes it's important, sometimes it's not. Sometimes the image has to stand on its own without any context at all. And sometimes you really need the context. Uh, your veteran portraits, the context of that, the, the, the fact that you were uh, commissioned to do that by a um, defense contractor, and, uh, but that they actually cared, that context is actually um, kind of humanistic, uh, unexpected from a yeah. defense contractor. Right, yeah, for them um, to say And that. then the yeah. other context that you're talking about, you go out and meet some pretty strange people and get them to stand in front of your camera. You have what I think uh, the tribe calls chutzpah. Yep. <laughs> which I, uh, a lot of street photographers are uh, sneak photographers, not walk right up into their face photographers like you do. Yeah. Um, but the one image that I need to find more context about is the guy with no clothes on and the, and the, the, the chainsaw, the chainsaw with the bandage on his arm. Okay. So that is, that is a friend of mine, a guy named Bobby. Okay. And, and I just, and it was the coldest day in November. <laughs> but I had a friend who was a boudoir photographer who challenged me to do doudoir, right? Just for fun. <laughs> it, was, it was a personal thing. Um, and at the time, all these different communities were emerging on Google+, Plus, so it goes back a bunch of years. And we cr decided we would create this theme, this meme of Manly Mondays. That was the image that kicked it off for me. So personal I'm not project. sure the other people have seen it. I saw it because it flashed over your website's main page. And then I looked for it and I never, I couldn't find it separately. Hang on. Let me see if but I got it. I mean, it's, it's just, I saw that shot and it's like, <laughs> all right, what the fuck's this story about? <laughs> um, I, I, can, I, I will keep talking and I will look okay. while I talk and then we can just flash it up. Anyway, I just, you know, uh, I don't flower um, uh, praise on people very often. Most of the time I'm telling people to go get them, get themselves fucked. But um, <laughs> I really like your work and, and I like the array of subjects. I really love your vulture portraits. Thank you. I mean, Here's that's Bob. it. <laughs> I it saw is, that and it's like, all right, what the fuck's the story with that? Yeah. So the, the, the funny thing is the banter. Like, this is where I wish I had known to record the conversation <laughs> because I told him to bring a really big chainsaw, <laughs> not knowing how endowed he was. And at one point he looked down and he said, you know, I could have made do with a pocket tool. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the, so. Uh, <laughs> Let me jump in. It, it yes. seems as though, to a large extent, you have just, you've gone out and photographed for your own interests and enthusiasms and so forth and made your own way. And essentially, people have come to you because of what you've shot, as opposed mostly to, uh, you know, getting an assignment that says, go out and shoot this uh, plate of food. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was all, well, you can't start as a photographer without having some body of work that people can look at. So I didn't know what I liked best. So it's varied. And I attribute the 
the good attitude that my mom instilled in me. That was every day she would say, good attitude, go out and have a good attitude. And so you take that and with people, with clients. I mean, one of the things that's rare is to find people who are working professionals whose only source of income is photography is they have a very different headset and worldview than I do. And I respect that. And again, I feel very fortunate. I don't have to sit and worry about what's going to come. For me, every assignment is joy-filled. Um, but, also, I, wait, but also it's because you had this, 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 this uh, legacy behind you working in the advertising agency. So you had a legacy. Well, I, I, I had an, I don't know. I don't think anybody hired me because I was Alan Shapiro who worked on, you know, the Dove account or- No, 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 but I, I don't know that either. But what I'm saying is that for the, for the young kid that decides to become a photographer, all right, yeah. with no other background except maybe some college work uh, mm -hmm. or, or he came out of the military as a photographer, all right, he doesn't have that legacy uh, to be able to say to somebody, well, here's my resume, and oh yeah, on it was something, some minor stuff that I did or major stuff that I did uh, on, on Madison Avenue. Yeah. Am but I right? My clients never knew of my other career. I, my photo clients didn't know my marketing background, not till mm -hmm. they became longstanding clients. And then it was like, oh, I wondered why you had such a, you had a good eye, right? You were interested, you were good at composing things. And I think that came from an art direction background. I'd also, I, yeah. I'd also like to, uh, what seems to me, and which is something I've tried to do over the years, is because budgets have changed and the, everything has changed, is that uh, when a client comes to you, you try to find out what's on the table in the way of revenue and try to make that work. Yeah. Would that be the case? For me, the 99% of my experience is really doing everything I can to get them to tell me how much they want mm -hmm. to spend because every client is different. And so what I thought was a lot of money for Apple, they laughed at me. And yet I am now working with a camera company <clears throat> who will remain nameless and they came to me with an exciting enough assignment where it's like, okay, when they told me the budget, I was kind of surprised, but whatever, you know, it's, it keeps me busy <laughs> and it. I, I, have, totally, yeah. I totally agree with that. Unless it's something, you know, really minimal, you know, yeah. so, yeah, I'm not going to go off the door for $200, right. but unless it's something really minimal, I try to find out what's on the table. Mm -hmm. and uh, and either and say yes or no or or counter that it used to be an old saying whoever whoever mentions money an amount first loses exactly yeah i want to go back a little bit to your talk about being colorblind john shields was asking because he's partially colorblind how do you deal with the color perception issues when working with designers and illustrators uh like <laughs> i said is, I it is what it is it is what it is, right? <laughs> I mean, as a photographer, I, I make sure everything, every device in my workflow from my cameras to all my different monitors to my printer is calibrated because I don't want to guess. And perhaps, you know, uh, I don't know, are my colors distinctive? I don't think so. Uh, so I don't know that I've ever seen it in real life. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. And, and for me, I want to ask about your pumpkin scapes. Yeah, pumpkin acid. <laughs> How many pumpkins have you photographed? <laughs> uh, probably over a thousand at this point. <laughs> Every fall, there are pumpkins everywhere and they all have nice asses. <laughs> Some of them have nice fronts too, you know, the stems. Much, mm -hmm. much, right, Cheryl? Come on, you gotta, hey, you gotta love the stems, right? <laughs> and the other thing was the Among Us collection. Can you tell us about that? Okay, that was, I have long been intrigued by the, the notion of angels among us. And it started from homeless people. I came home one night and I, had, I, I, I made friends with homeless people. I would bring them lunches and breakfasts, you know, whenever I was out. 
and I would invariably take their pictures. And I was one of the guys that would always get permission and say, look, I just, I, I want to document what you're dealing with and, and let's and acknowledge their existence. But I got home one day and I drew angel wings on one of the photos and I just doodled it. There was a guy sleeping and I drew wings flopped over the bench and dragging on the floor. And I said, holy cow, what would happen if that were actually the case? And again, it became this psychological exercise. So I had a pair of seven foot angel wings made and I decided I would walk around uh, New York and I would invite people to put them on knowing that there were two dynamics at work when you, and these wings weighed probably 25 pounds. They were heavy, and, you know, turkey feathers and the support and the armature behind people's back. Putting them on would, would result in some aspect of transformation. And then that was for them as they donned the mantle of being an angel. But then the reaction of the crowds was interesting as well and fed into, you know, like, so they would, they would start by feeling arrogant and then they would notice and then they would shrink or they would rise even taller. And so having a bunch of different people put on angel wings. And again, you know, the chutzpah that Jeff refers to, you know, you walk up to a six foot five guy with a sledgehammer doing construction work on a building in Manhattan surrounded by his buddies at lunch. And you say, hey, my friend, you know, put, can you put these wings on for me? And all his friends start giving him, you know, either grief or encouragement. Yeah, but that doesn't require chutzpah. That requires basem. Those two. Okay, so we're going to, for those of you who don't speak Yiddish, um, <laughs> hmm, takes balls. That's right? That's yeah. Um, anyway, so that, that was just a fun exercise. And it led to a book deal that I never followed up on. It led to an, you know, I just, I, I got busy and I got perfection paralysis. And that is something that I, I talk about a lot as I talk to creative people. I, I don't know. It is, it is a acute chronic lifelong affliction that I've had, and I, I have yet to find the cure for it. So uh, let me ask, um, number one, I'm, your work is incredible. I'm very happy. I'm not your competitor. Um, if there was something that you have not shot, not done, what is your dream thing you would like to go shoot or do, shoot, do? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the joke answer first, and women forgive me, but I want to shoot nudes for Playboy, you know. But they're no longer in business, right? I just come on. Um, I want. I think I want to shoot. I would love to be the White House photographer. I think that is like if I had to pick a dream job, that is the job I would want. I think being able to do a long-term documentation of. You miss, you, miss, you miss both things you could have had in one administration. Right. <laughs> the previous one. Exactly. <laughs> That's very good, Michael. That's very, you're right. You're right. I could have shot nudes and. Hey. So. Alan? Yes. I have a question. What's up, Cheryl? What's up? Um, it doesn't appear that you market yourself. You. Um, you take photos for yourself and then people notice you where how do they find you is it just through instagram or through speaking engagements how do you, these big companies find you uh through my website the red okay. book. <laughs> hmm? i said it jokingly i said in the agency red book the, yeah, the red book, the black, it used, there was a black book, there was a red book, there was- No, no, the red book for agencies, the black book was just for talent. Yeah. So- uh, Okay. Ra rarely, I, I've never, except for my, my food clients, my restaurant clients, I, I haven't had to go after anybody. Okay. All right. Sure? Well, I, I would love to see a book from you because I love your work and I, I feel that you shoot with emotion, um, especially the portrait work. Yeah. 
Um, they're very moving, those photos. Thank you. I've, I've actually put together a few of my own books on, you know, I've, they're, they're sort of on blurb. It's not, they're not cost efficient because blurb is ridiculous and expensive, you know, but again, once I get past this perfection paralysis, for me, I, I need to find a photo editor to work with because every time I look at a body of work, it's not about the sequencing. I just end up wanting to redo them. They're never good enough. Let, so, me, just inter let me interject something. You know, you can produce a book with blurb and just let blurb sell it uh, whenever somebody wants it. They'll advertise it and they'll sell it. Right, and that's, what, that's what I've done, Michael. But they're they're expensive. I mean, you know, a two hundred page photo book on portraits is one hundred and fifty dollars. Like, that's lunch money. Okay, For some good. people maybe <laughs> go find me on Blurb. There are four books there. <laughs> there's a portrait book. There's a black and white flower book, which for me was the easiest. There is. There is a huge book of flowers in the works, and at some point I will shop it around and hopefully something will come of it. I think that is to answer Ian's question. It's not what I want to shoot. It's that I really do want a real book out. And I know I can do it myself, but it doesn't seem the same as if I were able to work with a professional publishing team. I think that's that's the dream. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's too time consuming. To work with both the, a publisher and and, and yourself, uh, yeah. I mean, you're, I just, the publisher will drive you nuts. Okay. Well, I, again, I don't know what I don't know, and okay. so. What's your favorite? What's your favorite uh, 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 format camera? Uh, I love my Fuji GFX fifty. I'm. I'm debating buying the new 100 that came out only because I have a few clients like the Ritz-Carlton and Bose who require huge images. And I wanna start, and I know you can blow prints up enormously, but I wanna start with the, the, the best quality and the broadest dynamic range. And you know, so I love, I love the small medium format that Fuji has. The GF, I've shot the GFX 100. It's a, it's a really great camera. Yeah, uh, it's 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 ergonomic. It's not excessively heavy, yeah. and in the world of medium format, it's uh, pretty inexpensive. Yeah, what size also, sensor does it have, uh, Ian? It's a, a physical size. I don't know. It's a hundred megapixels. Yeah. So, on your food photography, are you doing natural light, or are you studio lighting these, or is Both. it a mix? Both. Both. It's mixed. It depends on the situation. There are mm -hmm. some clients who say we only want natural light, and I. I'm fortunate I live in, a, in an apartment that is walls and walls of light, so that's easy. But I also use uh, continuous LEDs. Mm -hmm. And do you, work, do you work out of your apartment or do you have a separate studio space? I do have studio spaces, plural. Uh -huh. I, you, know, you can rent them. Um, yeah, of course. And, and my apartment, this is a new condo that I'm in and we gutted it with the express purpose. Every surface is a shooting surface. Nice. You know, so we were able to, my, my, my happily ever after was very indulgent of me, so. That works out really nicely. When That's are you getting married? I don't know, Jeff, you wanna come? I mean, right now it's getting, it's figuring out how we have, cause for me, it's, it's, it's not my first, it's, it's the last wedding I'm ever gonna have, but I wanna surround myself with all of these incredible people that are in my life and I want them to feel safe. So how do you, when are we going to feel safe? It's a whole different kind of conversation. Yeah, I mean. Well, even when we're with, all vaccinated. Yeah, I mean, Alan was supposed to be on a few weeks ago, but even after his vaccination, you ended up coming down with COVID. Is that? Yeah. How are you doing these days? Is it all re feel recovered? I'm, I'm totally recovered. Once every week, I, I can't catch my breath for like a moment. That is the only side effect. But wow. It's real folks. So if there are any doubters out there, don't. And John, did you know that uh, Seth Resnick had oh. been in the hospital? No, I hadn't sick. heard that. Yeah, sick as a dog, but he's he's out, but he's falling under the term long hauler. Mm -hmm. I he's spoke gone. with him this morning and he, they have something, but the, C, the CDC uh, 
guidelines will not allow any of the people that Seth has been seeing with all these different shots he's been getting to uh, uh, tell him um, what he's got because there are so many different mutations out there that are yeah. coming up from, from South America. Also, and, Alan, did, did you know Seth Resnick? Yeah, yeah. The I do a lot of work with x ray and he's one of our Colorado. He's one right, of our but uh, did you know him when he was living in Boston? No. No, I was a Clint Clemens guy when, you know, when I, <laughs> I started at Hill Holiday. So I was up in Boston after graduating. So with, wait a minute, you started with what? Um, I was, Hol the agency I was at was Hill Holiday, but. Holiday Magazine? Hill Holiday, Connors oh, Club. Oh, 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 oh. At the time, the biggest agency in New England. So are you from New England? No, I just went huh. to RISD and didn't want to come home right away. <laughs> So I went over to Boston. It was fun, you know, being a 20 year old with all the all the pretty college kids roaming around. Very cool. Well, does anyone else in the audience have some questions for Alan? Feel free to speak up. Who's your favorite food photographer? Oh, Alan living, Shapiro. <laughs> living or dead? Uh, there are, who's my favorite? I don't know that I have one. I mean, for me, I'm more intrigued by the work that chefs are doing to push their plating techniques more than food stylists, because I think that is them upping their game. Did you know Dick Frank? Hmm? Dick Frank. Don't know that name. That's 1970s, 60s and 70s food photographer. So, yeah. yeah. But you know what he invented? You know the hot dog with the mustard that comes down the the hot dog and it's it's in a in a swirl swirl yeah that was dick Frank. he was a food photographer okay chocolate I mean, you had something foods. yeah so when you get involved with um clients who are looking to uh license images for or or, or hire you to shoot images for advertising for example um, do you find that because of your advertising background you kind of want to interject as to what they're doing or not doing and how do you keep your mouth shut <laughs> um i action speaks louder than words for me so if there is a layout that they want me to follow and i'm not happy with it what i will do is i will shoot exactly the way they want it and then i will show them what i think i should do so just extra credit i can't tell you how successful that keep your mouth quiet and just give them options strategy is you make clients for a very long time doing that. Times have changed. And have you have you seen clients um, use your images and advertising? And you said to yourself, "Boy, that was a clear miss. How did they do that?" Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, you can't. That's why. That's why we keep at it. It's never going to be perfect, but it can be more perfectly. Imperfect. Cool. Well, thank you, Alan. This has been great. Uh, is there anything else you want to say to folks here? It's all for shits and giggles until someone giggles and shits. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you all for joining us. It's been a lot of fun today. Um, we'll be back next week. And uh, till then, be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Alan. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. that was wonderful. Thanks, John. Sure. Thank you, Alan. Sure.